All right, all right. Red Nation, today we're gonna to be talking about tube loading. This actually determines how much heat you can put into your x-ray tube before you potentially would damage it. The units of heat that we have are joules, right? The heat that we deposit is actually proportional to the KV. If our KVP was perfect, if it was a nice flat KV, then this would just be the KVP. But this is the KV effective. KV, if we have a rectified circuit like this, if this is full wave rectified circuit, we would like the KV to be right here, right? But what we actually have is KVs in this range that come all the way down here, then they come back up, and we are gonna multiply that by the eight times the time. We could break this down then into W, which is a weighting factor, times the KVP times the MAS. So, so you'd like W to be close to one, if it's a nice perfect system, W is one. For the case of this full wave rectification, W is 0.71. So the blue areas in comparison with the red areas are gonna determine what W is. So that's 0.71. Here, W for a three phase, W is 0.96. For a 12 pulse, W is all the way up to 0.99. For a modern generator, W is typically pretty high in comparison with the traditional full wave rectification circuit, which was 0.71. Because physicists are just generally lazy, they wanted to define a unit, which was the heat unit, not to be confused with the Hounsfield unit, which is also abbreviated U. The energy in joules is the voltage, and it's the root mean squared voltage. So as you go over time, you're going to actually square that voltage and then take the square root of it all as an averaging procedure. But it's that root mean squared voltage times the tube current, times the time. The units are voltage, amps, and seconds. That's what we have for joules. This was actually defined a long time ago when it was actually the case that the full wave rectification was the normal way of doing it. So if we had a value of one in that case, that was normal to have a value of one. So it's the P times the MA times the time in seconds. Then if we need to convert between these two, it's actually the case that this factor here, for the case of a perfect KVP, a nice flat KVP, is basically 1.4. So the conversion from energy in heat units to energy in joules is you just multiply by 1.4. The power is just that energy divided by the time. The kilovolts times the current is how you get the power in what's called kilowatts. People used to spend a lot of time looking at these anode heating curves, printing them out in the clinic. Those curves actually weren't that useful. The IEC has actually discarded the maximum anode heat content as an actual useful unit. Now they've moved to a more clinically relevant way of doing the measurement. Assume that you're gonna turn that x-ray tube on for one tenth of a second. Then you're gonna take the next x-ray in a minute. If you think about actually taking an x-ray, then you have the patient move to the other position, you take another x-ray, you move to another position, you take another x-ray. This type of clinical workflow where you would take that x-ray and then the next one would be taken a minute or longer away, that tells you actually what's the capacity of your tube to keep up with that kind of workflow. So from a radiology perspective, this is found to be really useful. The basic mode is also designed for CT. In this case, assuming you're gonna take a four second scan, and then you're gonna take 10 minutes in between that scan and the next patient scan. So you take a four second scan, then 10 minutes for the next patient scan. Built into modern X-ray and CT equipment is also the tube algorithms, which basically model the actual components of your x-ray tube and will protect the x-ray tube from being overheated. What's the capacity to dump heat into this x-ray tube? If it has a relative small heat capacity, if you put the same amount of heat energy in there, the temperature is gonna go up a lot. So that's just shown here kind of just schematically. In both cases, we're adding the same heat. In this case, it has a small heat capacity, so the temperature goes up a lot. And in this case, it has a large heat capacity, so the temperature only goes up a little bit. The heat capacity basically just has to do with the material. So the specific heat of the material, 
and how much mass we have actually to distribute that heat over. We can also think about the heat capacity of the varying components of the system. So on the focal track itself, where the electrons are incident directly on the focal track itself, that's a relatively small area. So it has a relatively small heat capacity. For very short acquisitions, that's gonna limit actually the heat that we can dump into the tube is in the focal spot track itself on the anode. You can think of that here as being a smaller heat capacity for the track. The track actually can dissipate heat from the track itself to the rest of the anode. The anode is just a piece of metal, so it can actually transmit heat within the anode itself just via conduction. So that gets us heat to the anode body itself, which then has a larger heat capacity. From the anode body itself, we can then transfer heat to the actual tube housing. We can do that via radiant heating. We can also have radiant heating going from the uh, track itself to the tube housing. And so the tube housing is gonna be larger and actually have a larger heat capacity than the anode itself. The tube housing with convection distribute heat to the atmosphere, which again, I don't draw here, but the atmosphere has a large heat capacity. It's essentially the surrounding atmosphere within the room. You've got the tube loading down now, but how do we connect from wall power to actually power the tube itself? See our video on the X-ray circuit to really understand the basics of the x-ray circuit for powering your x-ray tube.